Haleluya, Christ is risen. Haleluya, Christ is risen. You know, when you say indeed, you are saying for sure it is. You are saying true. Actually, truly for certainty, there is resurrection for those who believe in Jesus. For those who could have forgotten my name, Joel Wawero is my name and I love Jesus as my Savior. I'm so glad to this Savior of mine for giving me another opportunity to celebrate his resurrection in my life. I'm also grateful that this is the 14th Easter that I have stood on this pulpit to say that he is risen. Now this is my last Easter to stand here as the Bishop of the Diocese because towards the end of this year I will be retiring. Next year, hopefully by this time, you'll have had a new bishop, if that will happen. Who will also stand here and proclaim the resurrection of Jesus. But the challenge is, have you embraced this resurrection? Is it indeed that he lives in you? Is it indeed that you can face tomorrow because he lives? We've been talking about the challenges that we are experiencing as Kenyans, as human beings. It is not only Kenyans. They are having a real struggle in the Middle East to celebrate Easter. They are having a real struggle in the Ukraine to celebrate Easter. They are having a real struggle in the UK, in America, those lands that you call lands of opportunity. But if you believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, you are able to say that you can face tomorrow and that all fear is gone. There has been a lot of talk about Easter and people are trying to explain that this comes from the atheists who used to worship a goddess of fertility who was called Ishtar. Yes, there could be some truth to that. But God takes what is nothing and, it may, and he makes it to be something in order for his glory and for his honor. Now, Easter dates back to the book of Exodus, chapter 12, from verses 21 to 28. When the children of Israel were in slavery and they were wondering how they would get out of it. And God commanded them to slaughter a lamb without blemish, without any spot. And they were to use that blood to sprinkle it or to paint it on the rentals of the doors of their households. Because an angel of death was to pass, especially amongst the households of the children of Egypt, and he would kill all the male firstborns who are there. But for those in Israel who followed this, the Bible calls it the Passover because it will be a passing over those houses. And this was a precursor. It was a reflection of what would happen to Jesus on the cross. I want to thank God that uh, Provost Paul, since he came to this cathedral, 
He has made imageries of Christmas, of Easter, and other festivals in order for us to grasp the meaning of what these seasons are. And therefore, although that place may appear like your old piano, but it depicts a good picture of what happened and what is there even today in Israel. For those of you who have gone to Israel, though the tomb is empty, and even in Israel it is empty, and though the cross is still there, just like we have it here. This was to imply the passing over on those who have the blood of Jesus Christ, that they are able to face their life in a, amidst its challenges. The other thing I would want to mention, the day of Easter goes back to the book of Leviticus. You can read when you go home. Verse, chapter 23, verses 9 to 14, where the children of Israel, after they entered into the promised land, they were to celebrate what was called the first fruits, the first crop of their harvest. They were to bring it to God. And this first fruit celebration happened on the first day of the week. The Passover also was happening on the first day of the week. Now for us, we take the first day of the week to be Monday. But in the Jewish tradition, the first day of the week is actually on Sunday because their week ends on Saturday, which is the Sabbath day. And Jesus is referred to as the first fruits that is mentioned in the book of Leviticus. Why is he called the first fruits? Because Jesus died and was put in the grave and he resurrected. He resurrected. He is not the first person to be resurrected. Of course, you know the story of Lazarus. He resurrected Lazarus. But where is Lazarus now? He's already dead. Of course, his spirit is in heaven, but he's not there in a body, a physical body, the way Jesus is. So Jesus was killed on the day of the Passover, and his body was put in the tomb. And on the feast of the unleavened bread, on the feast of the first fruits, he rose again, and he lives forever, even today. And we read in First Corinthians that after he rose again, he appeared to his disciples, and he appeared to over 500 people. Therefore, the resurrection of Jesus is very important. This cost the day of worship to be changed from Sabbath, Saturday, to Sunday. And Sunday, which is the first day of the week, is also the day when the Holy Spirit came. And it has now been referred to not as the Sabbath day, but as the Lord's day. Who are the first people to call it the Lord's day? It is the early Christian Jews who changed the day of worship from the seventh day to the first day. You know, the seventh day was the Hebrew Jewish observance of Sabbath doctrine, but this was changed. So the resurrection of Jesus is very, very important. I know I have mentioned the celebration of Easter and being likened to 
the day when the goddess of the god of Babylon was worshipped. However, the Jews who took over the Passover celebration, they made it the most important feast. And therefore, they forsook the Passover and they started celebrating Easter. So this place, this day, is a very important day. It is celebrated by billions of people in the world. And that is why what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 4, is very important. It is very important. If you go to the next chapter, chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verses 2, you see, it became the day when the disciples would meet together to worship God. Indeed, by then they were no longer disciples, they were now apostles. Those who believed in Jesus, they worshipped on that day. So in as much as you will see a lot of stories going on, on the social media, on the TikTok and so on, it is a very important day, not just for you, but for billions in the world who celebrate today. And I have no time to go through it, but when you all go home, I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 from verses 9, where Paul mentions six ifs. If Christ did not die and rise again, then our preaching is in vain. If Christ did not rise again from the dead, then we would be doomed. We would be like animals who die and they perish and they are forgotten. But thanks be to God who raised Jesus again on the first day of the week. The gospel that was read to us, we see Mary Magdalene going to the tomb. If you read in Mark chapter 16, verses 1, and Luke chapter 12, 24, verses 11, we see Mary and other women going to the tomb. They were not really going to see the resurrected Jesus. They were going to anoint Jesus. Why did they mourning? Because the book of Proverbs chapter 8 and verses 17, God says that he loves those who seek him early because they will find him. If you seek the Lord early in your life, then you'll be protected from all challenges in life. On Good Friday, I met an elderly man who is about 60, 60, 64 years, 65 years, who did not have his teeth, who did not have, who was limping, and he was sharing his story with me. And he told me how he got married when he was young, but he became an alcoholic. He would, he's a painter, and he would gain, he would get money but he would misuse his money in alcoholism and drunkenness. Those of you who follow social media, I think he's also on social media. And he was telling me, because he's now born again, how he wished he knew Jesus early in his life. Because he was knocked by muggers as they were uh, taking money from his drunken life, and they broke his leg. So if you find, if you seek the Lord early in your life, he will protect you from all the challenges that you would face. If you wake up early in the morning while it is still dark, while it is still silent, you'll be able to seek and find the face of Jesus because the noises in the world today 
are too much. The noises of the hustles and the hustlers are too much. But if you seek him early in the morning, you will see him. And we read that Mary went and discovered he was not there. I will not take you through the Greek of the three seeing because I mentioned them later or uh, previously. But I want to remind you that she ran and went and saw Peter and the other disciples and she told them that he is not there. Peter, who was an activist, he ran with his activism to go and see what was happening. And John, who was a mystic, who was contemplative, followed him. This is the same Peter who denied Jesus three times. But Jesus did not sideline him. Of course, Peter was an elderly man, and John was a young man. So when Peter came to the tomb, we read that he saw. He just looked casually. And that is what I called in, Hebrew, in Greek, blepo, looking and seeing. Somebody will see the sample of the tomb there and ask, what is this? I will just see it. Somebody will see the candles at the altar and wonder, what is this? That is John who came and he saw. I beg your pardon. And then afterwards, Peter came and he also looked. And he tried to theorize what could have happened. He saw the linen clothes were there. But he did not take anything, any cognizance of how the linen clothes were. But we read in verses 6 and 7, verses 7, John went back and he looked and he got the idea. He discovered that these clothes were not just lying there, but they were folded together. They were put together very well. He got the idea. Now there was a story that was going on that he had been stolen by his disciples. I don't think thieves have time to wrap up and fold clothes. Their work is to grab very quickly and mess up the place and disappear. But you see that we are told that the clothes were folded together and they were put properly. So this was somebody who was not in a hurry and this was somebody who knew what he was doing. And this is Jesus. We are also told in scripture that the priests decided that they would corrupt, they would give the soldiers key to Kidogo so that they could say that he was stolen by his disciples. They, were, they would have actually risked their lives if they said that. Why? Number one, because some of you are sleeping, you cannot become a witness when you are asleep because you have not seen what is going on. How would asleep soldiers be witnesses because they were not seeing what was going on? Number two, if they were sleeping on their job, the judgment was actually murder. They were to be killed. They were therefore risking their lives. So, we are here to remind ourselves that in as much as we have not seen these things physically, except probably for those who have traveled to Israel, there is evidence that Jesus died and rose again. He died and rose again. These things happened about A.D. 30. 
and they are being celebrated even as it today. We are living in a world that is full of frustrations, tensions, and problems. We desire to have peace. The text that we read in Isaiah chapter 25 and verses 8, it says that a time will come when he will swallow up the death. And the prayer that I have said at the beginning of my sermon, coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54, Paul says that death has been swallowed up in victory. And he is asking, Death, where is your power? Where is your victory? The power of death is in sin. And the power of the sin comes through the law. But Paul says that thanks be to God who has given us peace, who has conquered death. We live at a time when deaths, physical deaths are very common. There are people who are celebrating Easter with their dear ones in mortuaries and wondering what will happen, how they are going to celebrate Easter. The message of Easter is that he is risen indeed. And therefore, you and I can face tomorrow. It doesn't matter what ailment you could be going through. It doesn't matter what challenges you could be going through. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Oh, 